You're now listening to Sound Talent Media. Check out more shows at SoundTalentMedia.com. Hey friends, today's guest is Matt Embry, singer and guitarist for the Orange County, California band, RX Bandits. These guys started all the way back in 1995 as part of the Southern California Third Wave Ska Revival, but their subsequent albums have been anything but ska. They certainly haven't been afraid to take chances and push their creative boundaries from record to record. Today, Matt and I dive into Ruby Cumulus, the lead-off track from their 2014 album, Gemini Her Majesty. Matt shares the deeply personal and tragic story behind the lyrics, how the song was initially way different than what it turned out to be, and him and I both refer to the same classic heavy metal band when referencing one of the guitar parts. For all this and much more, grab your favorite beverage, sit back, and enjoy this songwriting journey with us. Hey, hey, have you heard? Krista makes a podcast. Hey, hey, have you heard? Krista makes a podcast. Hey, hey, have you heard? Krista makes a podcast. Hey, hey. I was thinking earlier, the first time that I ever heard the name RX Bandits, and I had to really think, because I believe the first time I heard your name pronounced it, you were, the, you were still the Pharmaceutical Bandits before the name change. And this was through Richard Rains and Stephanie Rains, the uh, co-owners of Drive Through Records. And that would have been, geez, probably, probably somewhere in the late 90s. <laughs> yep, that sounds about right. And you guys were then... Uh, I don't know, I guess labeled as a third wave of ska, uh, that type of, of band being from Southern California. But wow, have, uh, have you guys evolved? I mean, you're one of those bands that just took this sound and it seems like, you know, every record since then, you, you just kept evolving uh, in, into, into what you become. And it's, uh, it, it's really cool to, to have seen your evolution. Thanks, man. I think we, we were just, we were, you know, young kids when we started we were, you know, our first record, which I don't even like that it even <laughs> exists out there. But, I, you know, I was only 16 years old. We were all still in high school and, and it shows <laughs> by the musicianship and subject matter. But, uh, yeah, man, we just, as we grew as musicians, we just, um, we wanted to play stuff more challenging. And not only that, but, you know, our taste change, like everyone's taste change as you get older. Much to the chagrin of Richard and Stephanie, for sure, because like every album, you know, would be different and we would lose like a, you know, a chunk of our fan base every new record. But I think the people that that really dug it, it made them love us more because they, you know, the people who are along for the ride, they are all about it, you know. Absolutely. You know, when you're running a record label, you don't want your band that you're selling a bunch of records with all of a sudden start to change in between albums. That gets a, gets a little scary. But from the artist standpoint, you want to grow. And I, I completely get that. And you were so <laughs> young when you made those initial records. For the listeners, Matt also plays with Dispatch. And how long have you been playing with them for now, Matt? Uh, it'll be coming up on five years. Awesome. Congratulations. Yeah, I had wasn't too long Thanks. ago I heard you were playing with them, and I was uh, I was surprised just because I, I guess I didn't know and uh, thought that was really cool. And, and Matt also plays in The Sounds of Animals Fighting with former RX Bandits trombonist Rich Balling, as well as Anthony Green of Circa Survive. So you've been uh, been a busy man as well as we share a common link, Matt, with uh, Less Than Jake was the backing band on the first Bruce Lee band record. And uh, you also backed up Mike Park uh, mm. on the Beautiful World EP. So uh, that's that's pretty cool. Mm. Yeah, that is cool. I didn't know that. I didn't know that about you guys. That's cool. Well, you know, in, in speaking of this evolution of the band, uh, we're going to get to the track that we're talking about today, uh, Ruby Cumulus. And this this song's a monster. The arrangement is... It's crazy. I, I admire songs that I, I that I hear that I go... I don't even know where to begin to try to write a song like this. <laughs> and I mean that with the <laughs> utmost sincerity. This, this track is a monster. Oh, thank you, man. I appreciate you. Hey, no problem. Um, this uh, track comes from the 2014 album Gemini, Her Majesty. Uh, the previous record uh, to that was called, I think I'm pronouncing this right, it's uh, Mandala? Uh, yeah, Mandala. 
yep. Mandala. They mm-hmm. came out in 2009, so yep. pretty good gap between records there. Do you recall when you wrote Ruby Cumulus? Was this uh, something that was written between albums or something specifically for uh, Gemini, Her Majesty? So the reason there was so much time in between albums is because the band broke up. And it was it was a weird like breakup. It was it was like an overreaction on our part. You know, our drummer had his first baby, and I think he was feeling the understandable stress of having a child your first time and kind of like learning how to deal with that and learning how to fit your life around it. Um, weave the two together, and so sure, we kind of just decided, hey, you know, maybe it's time to like call it. When really we should have just been like, let's just take a break until things get more mellow. You know, we'd been touring so hard for years, so hard. That year before we we literally did a world tour um, as an independent band, you know, so it's a lot harder than, you know, someone who's got the means. But um, as far as that song, I believe it was written about six months before we recorded the record. It was one of the first songs we wrote when we were compiling songs. We didn't know if we were going to put out a new record or an EP, or we just kind of like got back in a room together after not playing together for a couple years. And just that actually, it started like most of our songs as just like one little riff. Now you, now you say one little riff, but this song has so many riffs. So which riff, which <laughs> riff, which riff are you talking about? <laughs> I know. And dude, this may sound strange, but the song is actually like quite a bit scaled down from its first iteration. We, we really went out of our way to like trim the fat off it, if you will. But uh, the riff that I'm talking about is the, the chorus part. I don't even know if you call it a chorus part, but the, uh, the one that kind of pedals on uh, A, the do 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 that one. Yeah, I'm I'm calling that the post chorus, but we'll we'll get to that. We'll get to that. All right, I like that. But uh, you know, it's funny that this this track is four minutes and fifty seconds. It's just shy of five minutes, and you're saying that you trimmed this song down. So was there just more of a overall jam vibe to this thing? It was just just a, a longer arrangement, or was there actually other lyrics and other parts? <laughs> no, there wasn't any more singing, but initially the little end riff was longer, and it kind of got more verbose and kind of went off on like a sort of Iron Maiden-y tangent, which in retrospect, I wish that we had left in now. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, honestly, Chris, like 450, that's kind of a short song for us, or I would say mm-hmm. sh- on the shorter side, which like we fully realize that that's kind of long in general, right? So yeah, that the end riff got cut down, and I want to say there was a middle part. There was no other parts that we cut out, just stuff got cut down. I think this song has to be 450. It takes you it takes you on a journey, it takes you on a ride, and it's so great to analyze songs from this uh vantage point. And and hosting this show, I just it's been so interesting to me. The thought of of my band doing a 4 minute and 50 second song makes me shudder. I don't know what we play for 4 minutes and 50 seconds. <laughs> What? You know, yeah. you, you get in front of you get in front of our audience. I don't know what the hell they'd think of that, but I know uh. that, uh, that 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 this works for you. And again, I, there's not anything in this song that I would cut. It takes you on a journey. Uh, it, the whole thing is interesting. And you mentioned Iron Maiden, which is funny because Iron Maiden is actually in my notes for the song. And we'll get, no way. We'll, we'll get to that in a few. Oh, but, that's cool. You know, when when you and I had had spoke by text the other day, we were setting this up. You had mentioned to me that the the subject matter to Ruby Cumulus was was really heavy uh, and and you had you had asked is you know is that is that what your show's about would you want something like that and I told you that that, that it all goes uh, if you're willing and comfortable to talk about it and reading over these lyrics I kind of have an idea what I think the song's about but uh, I, I'd love for you to set it up okay cool um, do you want to talk about a specific part or just the Genesis or well, why don't you give us a yeah a, a short synopsis or genesis, and then then we're gonna hop into the arrangement and hop into the lyrics. Gotcha. Okay. Well, uh, basically, the song is about um, a friend of mine who took her life. And um, mm-hmm. do you want the long story or the basic short story? 
I think we can go with the basic story, uh, but but again, I'm 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 leaving this to to up to you of how how you like to present it, Matt. Okay, cool. So it's about a friend of mine who took her life at a very young age. Someone who had reached out to me uh, years before. She was struggling with addiction, and she kind of just sent like a hail mary email to to me, uh, we were her favorite band. And, um, I happened to answer. I don't really ever check my Facebook messages much, much less then than even now. Um, but I did. And we started emailing back and forth. And, um, so she, sometimes, you know, she would relapse, she'd go in and out and sometimes she would call me late at night or, or anytime. And most of the time I would answer and, um, we would talk, uh, and I would try and help her with whatever she's dealing with, kind of relate in my own struggles in my life. And, um, you know, just try and tell her it, it gets better and, and, and it will get better and tell her the things, you know, that, that she needs to do. Well, not that she needs to do, but the things that I think that would help her. And, um, one night she called at like four in the morning and I didn't answer and um, the next day, her best friend told me that she took her life. And um, oh. so, you know, that song, as a songwriter, I think you probably understand that there's times when you don't even feel like you are writing the song. Um, that, yeah. that like the words or the music just come to you. At least that's how I feel sometimes that, that I don't write anything, but I just sort of like pick stuff out of the ether that's flying around and this one this one felt like that you know um yeah and it when when i found out man i mean it re- it crushed me it really it crushed me um, yeah i uh, well i i i have to to say i'm uh struggling for words first and foremost uh, i'm sorry um thank you for uh for sharing that that is very deep and um, the, the the song, I picked up on some of that. I didn't know the exact thing, but I picked up on these lyrics. And and yes, I do relate to to you. Feel like this sometimes songs are gifts that they just they just come to you. And and it, and then this instance, it seems like uh, truly sounds like it was a gift for you. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was a gift. It's one of my favorite songs that I've ever written. It's one of the my favorite Our Expanded songs of all time. And although it's like, it's terrible that how it came to be, um, the lyrical part of it, um, it's, you know, a lot of the, that whole album is, is for her and, and another one of my friends who unfortunately went, you know, had the same fate around the same time. And, um, you know, I never wanted to write a eulogy song for anyone you know i don't you never want to be in that situation you know especially when you're you know when you're really young of course um but i just hope that that it's a it's an adequate one and and that song ruby cumulus isn't meant to be a eulogy it's it's more about being honest about how i felt and you know like i said a lot of a lot of it's just raw emotion and mixed with memories and you know dreamscape sort of stuff and or more nightmarish and and actual stuff that happened with her and I and um uh like conversations we had like that I pulled actual stuff that she would tell me about into into the song do you mind if I ask you what the title Ruby Cumulus means? Because, you know, Cumulus without the, you, you spell it C-U-M-U-L-O-U-S. Uh, cumulus without the O on the end is like a layer of, of a, a cloud formation. Uh, what, what does this title mean? <laughs> uh, well, th- that's funny. I'm assuming it just got misspelled on uh, Spotify or whatever else. I've noticed. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> so it is, it is, it, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I've I've noticed like a bunch of our songs are randomly misspelled on like streaming services. 
Yeah, and I I like to do my homework here on Krista Makes a Podcast. Uh, damn it, Matt! <laughs> and 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 I spelled your damn song wrong. So who's the idiot now? Thank you. Um, so there is no O there. Okay, so now it makes sense. So was her name Ruby? Uh, no, no, her name. No. Wasn't Ruby. Okay. Okay. So the title Ruby Cumulus came about. That's a strange title. <laughs> there is what I feel like it represents for me but i would rather have the listener interpret it themselves a hundred percent respect that and i have songs and lyrics of mine that i that i say the same thing too so yeah. uh com- completely completely get that and we're we're going to move on we're going to get into the uh the beginning of the song here again the song is four minutes and 50 seconds and uh, you know this whole beginning th- there's like this ambient noise at the top uh th- there's parts where it sounds like there's a track maybe even this track is played backwards and then the keyboard comes in by itself for like five seconds yep. and then the band comes in yep. the band comes in and it takes you on this I-, I keep saying it but but matt it takes you on this cool little journey and you're just kind of f- i feel like you're floating <laughs> almost when i'm listening to it and then at a minute and 13 seconds which you're almost through a lot of uh, band songs at a minute 13 or you're at least <laughs> past this the first past the first chorus yep. um and I, and I wrote here in my notes, the Iron Maiden harmony guitar lead comes in. I love it. It's kick-ass, man. <laughs> Thanks, dude. Yeah, we were trying to take the listener on a little journey, you know, a little mission. You know, it's the first song on the record, so it's like, in a way, it was introducing the whole record to people. Right, right, and I and I do want to say I meant to say it a, a moment ago that you guys have a lot of albums out. I think you're up to what eight, eight records now, eight full lengths. Well, seven, seven. Okay, s- s- seven records. It's it, it's kind of here nor, here nor there. What I'm getting at is you guys have True. a lot of songs, and a lot of times I'll have the uh, the guest pick a song. In this case, I went to you. Out of all your songs, I picked this one, and it's one of your favorite tracks of our expandits which thrills me to death because i could have picked a number of songs that i like from you guys but the fact that this one's at the top of the heap for you is really cool and like when i first brought it up i thought you were apprehensive you didn't like it but i think it was because the song the subject matter so heavy you were a bit apprehensive but i'm really thrilled that uh, that you're stoked on it you know i was a little trepidatious about falling to pieces on a uh, something that would be in the internet ether for the rest of all existence I completely understand. And again, uh, you know, thank you for, for being so, uh, upfront about it and sharing it with us. Cause it's, it's really special Yeah, no worries. at, uh, at a minute and 21 seconds, we're, we're into the first lyric. We're into the, we're into what I'm calling verse one. Uh, and the lyric is once my lover, now she's dressed up in gold, silk and cedar sleeping out in the cold. And I kind of have a feeling what I think that line's about. Uh, it's heartbreaking, but could, could you set up that first verse? Yeah, it's just uh, it's just the imagery. It's, it's just the imagery of a kind of a funeral sort of imagery. Yeah, that line, silk and cedar sleeping out in the cold, is heavy. And yep. you use the word imagery. I probably say that every episode. Uh, I, I love lyrics with imagery that, that tell a story. And boy, does this ever tell, tell a story. Uh, we get into to pre-chorus one. Uh, what, what I'm calling the pre-chorus, and correct me uh, along the way, Matt, if you, if you, uh, I, I, I like to have a healthy disagreement on the show. Okay. Uh, but I'm calling this, I'm calling this pre-chorus one. Got my badge, got my gun, got my anger. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's a pre-chorus. As much as there is a pre-chorus in the song, it's I, yeah, I, I, I'd go okay. with you on that one. I think you nailed it. And can you set up that line lyrically for us? I always forget which which it is, if it's simile or metaphor, like when you are saying you are something that you're not. Is that a simile? Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway. for, the sa- for the sake for the sake of sounding stupid, I'm going to say I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you understand what I'm saying. Uh, I totally understand what you're saying. <laughs> I'm equating I'm equating my own anger and shame and sadness, but mainly with the rage of a cop. Which, I mean, this goes really deep, but, you know, I'm, I haven't had many great experiences with police officers in my life. Not at all saying that police officers are just bad by design, but it's me and, and that's my experience. But so in, right. in this particular song, I'm sort of, I'm equating 
my badge and my gun and my anger, like that's my, my power. While in reality, I had none. I had no control over myself or the situation. You know, I think the the rule book has been thrown out in the song of, of what a typical chorus would be. I'm calling the next part the chorus. There's nothing here that kind of repeats over and over like a typical chorus, but this is what I would call the chorus in the song. And and, and this uh, this part's really interesting. And I'm gonna I'm gonna read the whole thing, and I'll have you uh, you talk about it. She didn't want to sleep alone that night, and I said, "Who would say no? Who would say no?" I didn't answer when she called that night. Oh my God, 20 years old, 20 years old. Now when I close my eyes, I see her face. Because the love you give is the love you take. And the heart you hold is the one you break. So, I don't want to get too in-depth about it. I want to be respectful. But what I can say is that the beginning of that part is pretty much directly from some of the things that she spoke to me about on the phone about when she was really struggling and didn't have places to live. And she told me about a time when she overdosed and then called the police before she blacked out. And she said she felt like she was falling asleep before they got there. After this had happened... If, if you remember, you recall, I know you said the song was written about six months uh, before Gemini, Her Majesty, the record it came from. But how long after she passed did, did you write the song? If I remember correctly, she passed in August 2012. So uh, probably a year later. Do you remember if it was done in one sitting, like the, the, the basic chords and, and lyrics? Or did you have to go back to it to finish it? Yeah, no, m- pretty much none of our songs are ever written that way. This one had, like I said, that basic riff at first. Okay. That basic riff, if I remember correctly, was probably tagged on some other song. A lot of the time, what we do as a band is like we get in a room and we just jam. Sometimes we'll throw out, you know, let's let's play in this key or this mode or something like that. Um, and other times we just play what we feel and everyone else kind of follows along. And if we find something we like, we go, cool, let's record that or let's remember that and come back to it. So that's what that riff was for a while. Then Choi came up with uh, the the sort of, well, I call it an Iron maiden riff, but not not the guitar solo, the harmonized solo part, but the part at the end. The do 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 right? Um, and he also came up with the... The part, it's sort of like that classical moving part that in the verse. You, yes. you know what I mean? Do 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 mm-hmm. that part. I think it was in a different key initially, but then we were like, yeah, let's mash these together, see how they go. And then once those two riffs clicked, then we wrote the rest of the song in like an hour. You know, because I was just like, oh, we need this pre-chorus. And I'm like, let's play this, you know, this little descending line in G, right? Oh, boom, pre-chorus. And then let's do this part, you know, uh, and then we add the song. That's interesting. You kind of wrote backwards. That's 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 cool. Yeah, it's just a lot of the time our songs will start with it. They It's literally one of two ways. It's either Choi or I will write um, a guitar and melody line and I bring it to the band and then we build around that. But that, that is usually, that's the minority. That's only like 30% of the time. The majority of the time, it's some sort of jam that we had. And then once we kind of unlock it with another part, then it, it'll just all come together. You know, like it, like it's, the, it's gravitational pull as a song gets strong enough to pull the other parts to it. Gotcha. Okay. Well, after the chorus is what I'm calling the post-chorus. And, and before we get there, just briefly, I want to talk about producer Jason Cup, who produced the record. Uh, Jason's produced American Football, Anthony Green. Uh, some of his other uh, engineering credits include Avril Lavigne and Jimmy Eat World, uh, my favorite <laughs> album by Jimmy Eat World, Fu- Futures, yeah. actually. What do you feel Jason brought to the table with, with this track? Did, did he have a lot of hands-on with it, or was it kind of brought to him as is, and he basically just recorded it? Um, it was brought to him as is. Jason has been a friend of ours for, for a while, a long time. In fact, 
uh, we toured together in 2007. He was working with a band called Nurses, which is a big reason why we ended up going with him, aside from the fact that he was a close friend. But um, the, okay. the first Nurses record, it's called Hanging Nothing But Our Hands Down, is incredible to me, is one of the most underrated records of the 21st century. If you haven't heard it, go check it out. It's amazing. And, I will. And I um, will. it's like weird, quirky pop. It's not, I don't want to say pop, but it has a pop element. It's very catchy, but it's, it's great. It's seriously, it's great. And um, Jason's fingerprint on that as a producer and more than anything as an engineer, as a sound creator, it is so unique and cool and like clean and he really went out of his way to make every song sound different but they all have a similar thread and so um when we approached him to do this record we didn't want him to have any production input as far as like songwriting we've never asked for that we we prefer to write all of our own music ourselves, but we did want his input as far as like sonics and uh, the different sounds, and he had a huge impression as far as like the different sounds of the songs. The number you have reached is 100.7 WMMS. It wasn't just a radio station, it was a lifestyle. Cleveland is, is a rock and roll city for sure. Get down! Get down! The wrath of the buzzer. WMMS. Cleveland. The rise and fall of one of the most iconic radio stations in America. Profiles, The Wrath of the Buzzard, P-R-O-H Files. Subscribe now wherever you get podcasts. You know, you mentioned Choi earlier. For the for the listeners, uh, Matt was speaking to Steve Choi, who's the band's guitarist and uh, and keyboardist. So I just wanted to let everybody at, at home know, uh, know what that reference was. And then what I'm calling again, Matt, the post-chorus, the lyric is, It's my behavior that I abhor. I was her savior, and she was my scapegoat. So... When you're saying it's my behavior that I abhor, was that just you were upset at yourself for not answering that call? Yeah, partially. Uh, that line in general is very sarcastic. I'm referring to myself as a savior when the truth of the matter is that I had no ability to save anyone, myself or anyone else. The behavior I'm speaking about in that is that particular time in my life was just an absolute mess. I did not have my shit together and I got very close to the edge. And sometimes I think, you know, sometimes I wonder what, you know, why I ever went down that kind of path or what I was searching for or what kind of pain I was trying to cover up. And I still don't know kind of what I was talking about before is like the kind of shame, you know, when something traumatic happens in your life, it brings up a lot of other feelings as well. And, um, mm -hmm. I think that's what I'm talking about is, it's my, it's my own self-loathing, you know, that I'm talking about. Um, wow. And yeah. And, and and I imagine I don't want to speak for you, but that that self loathing is is something that you could you could relate to her with of what she was going through. She was obviously going through some some uh, torment of self. Oh, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. You know, part of part of addiction, part of drug addiction is you get addicted to the shame and the guilt as well. That's something people don't talk about very much, but it, it's true. You get you get addicted to like, I can't speak for everyone, but at least you get addicted to being like down and then up again and down and up, you know, and you get addicted to, to feeling like, you know, angry at yourself and ashamed. And then you make excuses for yourself, you know, and you, and you kind of, uh, fill yourself up with denial and you do it all over again. It's not it's not just like the drugs. It's everything that comes with it. Oh yeah. I mean you talk to a number of friends of mine, it's like, you know, I, I put the drink down, but then I had to face what was inside. Yes. That second verse, you know, Ruby Cumulus in an alley alone, dial the number, babe, but there's nobody home. And then we get into pre chorus two, 
which is, and, and this is kind of where I, I, I was putting two and two together here before we even spoke about the drug addiction, because you mentioned got my foil, got my fire, uh, got my sorrow. And uh, that really jumped off the page at me, Matt. That's a, that's a pretty heavy lyric. What did that mean for you, Chris? Not being judgmental, I've never smoked drugs off of foil, uh, but I, I assumed it was smoking drugs. You know, got my foil, got my lighter, my fire, uh, but I still got my sorrow. I still have my pain. Yeah, you pretty much nailed it. Although I will also say it, it also refers to, you know, your foil is like your enemy. It's your, um, your nemesis. And, right. and fire is like t- your anger. Wow. It, it meant it's meant to mean both things for sure and and as we're getting further into this song now i'm gonna listen to it when we're done with this i'm gonna listen to it in a completely different way and that's that's the power of music you hear things one way and you know a story of it and it's just i could see why this song means so much to you uh at first you're like it's one of my favorite songs i'm like oh yeah musically because it takes you on this journey it's crazy and it's that mixed with with the subject matter that's just completely heavy not just for for her but but heavy relating to you and what you were going through uh this particular time period yeah it was heaviness heaviness all around but um i i can't remember who said it it's one of my favorite authors i want to say it's either Charles Bukowski. I'm pretty sure it's Charles Bukowski who said, all good art is honest art. And yeah. a lot of the time when I'm writing lyrics, and it, and it's part of one of the reasons that I'm willing to talk about this with you today, is uh, sometimes when I'm writing stuff and, I, and maybe I'm getting to the point where I, it's like I'm having those like pangs, like the twinge a little bit, like this is getting a little too personal. This is getting a little too... You know, I'm letting people in too much. I've really had to learn to purposefully avoid that feeling or just push through it. Because if if what you're saying is honest, then it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what people are going to read into it or think about you. It doesn't matter because it's better than writing down something that's not real. Especially in your case, and not that we... How do I say this without sounding, I don't mean it to come off as arrogant or egotistical, but, you know, we don't owe anybody anything as musicians, but, you know, our fans do follow us, they do support us, they do give us a career, and by being that transparent and that honest of what you just said, Matt, uh, with your lyrics, may- maybe, just maybe, you'll you'll save somebody from doing something awful or, or possibly hurting themselves, uh, that, they, that they're doing something they can't come back from. You know, I, I would never purport to to be able to stop anyone or motivate anyone to do anything either way i i do know how beautiful music and the power of music and and i know how i relate to it and how how much it's you know influenced me and i'm sure you know i'm probably speaking for you as well you know the 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 art the especially music that you hear that really speaks to you you know it changes you in in a way in i mean yeah. in a very palatable way but yeah, you're right. I mean, as an artist, we don't we don't owe anyone anything. To have respect and appreciation for your fans is is a totally separate thing than to feel beholden to anyone when you make art. Sure, sure. No, and I and I, I really only brought that up because I, I I'm I'm assuming you've had this happen too. But I've had fans of ours say that your music saved my life, and that's the highest compliment you could get yes. as a musician, in my in my opinion. Oh, hundred. Hundred percent, thousand percent. I totally agree. There's nothing, and and they'll even preface it. And I'm sure you've heard this. Like, hey man, I'm sure you've heard this a million times. But and it's like, and they they tell you that it's like I don't care how many times I hear that. It, it affects me deeply every time. And I always thank them and usually give them a hug. And 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 I mean it with sincerity every time. It's the h- highest compliment you you could get paid as a musician. It really is. I want to get into chorus two, which is the chorus two is the same lyric as chorus one. She didn't want to sleep alone that night. And I said, who would say no? Who would say no? I didn't answer when she called that night. Oh, my God. 20 years old, 20 years old. Now, when I close my eyes, I see her face because the love you give is the love you take. And the heart you hold is the one you break. And getting into the post chorus number two, this one is twice as long as the first one. You got mm-hmm. that guitar riffing. Mm-hmm. The guitar riffing that you, you base the song around is, is underlying this one too. It is twice as long. It's my behavior that I abhor. I was her savior and she was my scapegoat. 
Like paper angels strung in a row, drunk with inertia, they never grow. That's a really interesting line. Yeah, it's just, um, I had like a, not, not a vision, that sounds so pretentious, but, you know, I had just an idea of, you know how on a Christmas tree, like different ornaments, how, well, at least for me, you know, when I, sometimes when I get to like, um, set up or, or decorate the Christmas tree, sometimes I get to do it with my mom, depending on like, you know, uh, her schedule and my schedule and whatever. And, uh, you know, she'll pull out different ornaments from like when I was a child, you know, you know, when that happens Uh huh. and it's like, Oh yeah. And you're like, Whoa, because you're taken back to this time. You know, for me, it's like late eighties or something. And when I look at those pictures, it's just, it's always frozen there. Oh yeah. Right. And in a way, you know, that's, that's how it is when, when you lose someone is they are, they're always going to be the age that, that you knew them. Yeah. They're, 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 they're frozen uh, to when they passed. That's, yeah. that's, yeah. I, I, I can completely understand that. And I completely understand the, the example of your mother that, that you, that you gave uh, digging the, those old boxes out and seeing something. T- it takes you right back. The, the sight, the, the sounds, the smells, whatever was going on. Um, yep. after this part, after this part, there's four lyrics, there's four lines and I, I searched it online. I could not find it. All the lyrics online stop with drunk with inertia. They never grow old. There's, there's something here. You, you say something about the earth and something about her. Do you know those last four lyrics? Shoot. Uh, off the top of my head. No, it's okay. I don't know. I don't know if it's like this for you when you're singing tunes but sometimes i don't even remember the words until i'm at that point in the song and singing them does that make sense it, well yeah and then if you start thinking about it, that's when you're gonna that's when you're gonna gonna mess up live yeah exa- exactly <laughs> i've done that before i'm like wait is the second verse is coming up what does it start with i go oh now i'm screwed but if i don't if you're on automatic if you're on automatic pilot it's just like uh it just kind of flows through i completely get that it's true because you get you get the muscle memory of singing those words over and over, night after night, night after night. And it almost gets to the point where you're not even thinking about the words. It's just like the sounds and the the notes that you're making with your mouth. You know, it's like I, I forget that I'm actually saying words at times when I'm singing. Well, th- this sounds like almost like a complete stream of consciousness at the end that it was almost like just kind of some syllables strung in with actual words. It- it's really uh, an interesting part because I must have listened to it, Matt. I'm not kidding you, 15, 20 times trying to discern what the lyric was. And I just I'm, I'm hearing Earth. I'm hearing her. Uh, and I think it's I think it's actually cool that you don't know. Our listeners can go listen to the song and uh, <laughs> and and and, and uh, decipher it themselves, because it's an interesting part in, in that the rest of the song. I can really understand most of what you're singing and how you enunciate it. And this was uh, really interesting in the fact that that I couldn't. And I was wondering why. It's really not a surprise that you can't recall uh, off the off the cuff what the lyric is because of, because of the nature of it. Yeah. Um, at, at three minutes and fifty nine seconds, the four minute mark, we get some ooh ooh oohs uh, that happen. You're kind of just kind of just singing after the, the the four lines I was speaking of, uh-huh. and that goes on till about uh, four minutes and twenty three seconds in the song, and then this jam happens at the end of the song with those riffs that you're talking about, and yep. there's some modulation that goes on. There, it's jumping keys, and this whole thing is just I'm going. Where is this going? It's almost like what we call, and I've said this in other episodes, uh, there, there's good train wrecks in music and bad ones. And this is a great train wreck. There's just so much going on here. I'm like, holy crap. And the other interesting thing I want to say, and I'll let, let you talk about this part, is I didn't put it on a metronome, but it feels like it speeds up until it abruptly ends. The song mm-hmm. just ends. Did it ramp up there, or am I just hearing the intensity of the riffs and how it was put together, and it's all on one click? <laughs> Real quick, Chris, I I really appreciate how much you've gone in on this and the and the attention to detail. 
I, I really appreciate oh, it. Thank, thank it, you. It's cool. And, and coming from a musician like yourself with so much experience and so much skill, uh, it, it's just cool. It's like I've never got to uh, to really go over these parts like this, but it's it's made me think about them in a different way. But to uh, to oh, unpack, thank you. Yeah, to unpack that, um, I, I remembered a thing um, about the the random the line the random lines that I can't remember. Yeah, one, yeah. One thing I can remember about that is that so we recorded this whole record at this old weird sort of haunted ranch in Northern California where we stayed for three weeks. We lived in this, like what we called the murder house, like from the Simpsons, uh, because it was just like this ghostly, like paint peeling off the sides, like super drafty, everything's creaky. And then we would record in this like converted barn every day. But then we did all the uh, vocals in my mom's garage uh, we just put a bunch of blankets up in the corner and we sang into the mic that I'm talking to you in right now. And that particular part was just a freestyle. I want to say when I was doing the scratch vocals for everyone else to like put their uh, overdubs on. And I tried to redo it so many times. And at the end of the day, Jason and I were just like, no, that first one that weird one where people can't really understand what you're saying until the last couple lines where you never get hurt, (laughs) you know, bow to the earth. Um, something I want to say something to blame. You never get hurt. I can't remember, but, um, okay. You say hurt. No, I thought you said her. Okay. Oh no. the, the, The last line is so you'll never get hurt. Um, okay. But, uh, yeah, we, we can never get it. You know, I'm sure you've had that happen where like your first take is just the best take. Not and it's Abs- it's not in, absolutely yeah, it's not in the best like pitch, you know, and it's kind of <laughs> it's kind of weird. It's it's slurred and you can't really tell what I'm saying, but it fits the vibe of the song more than any other time that I tried to redo it. So it's yeah, it's those uh, it's those happy accidents that we that we keep. Yeah, exactly. Um, but as far as the the end riff, the um, the good train wreck, as you called it, which I cannot wait to tell my band members that because I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm glad you weren't offended because I meant it with uh, the utmost sincerity. <laughs> no, man. No, I, I appreciate it. It was we definitely were going for the like train off the rails vibe. So I'm, I'm glad you felt the same way. Yeah, so it does speed up there, and we we meant to speed it up, but also we didn't record anything to a click ever. Like, not a single one of any of our songs have ever been recorded to a click. So there was no metronome to hear anyway, um, but the point was to speed up as if, because you wanted to, like, raise the tension, raise the tension. And like I said, originally, that shit went on for a lot longer. It had a whole other part that was even more Iron Maiden-y, but we thought... We thought, ah, oh, you know, that's just that's a little over the top. Let's just let's trim it and have it end. Bam, you know. Yeah, well, I I think it's it's the perfect ending. It it builds this tension. It's taking you someplace, taking you someplace, and boom, there, there's something uh, something about that ending that's uh, it's jarring yet it's haunting, and it completely fits in fits in with the lyric. Um, before we wrap up here, I I just want to say again, I, I want to thank you so much for. Uh, talking about this it's incredibly uh, personal and i know that the listeners are going to feel uh feel like they got something really special here today matt yeah well i appreciate you uh reaching out to me it's been much more enjoyable uh to talk about than i i i expected well that 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 makes me feel good and I, i i really appreciate that is there anything you'd like to plug with any of your projects anything solo anything with the uh rx band that's coming up well, we had shows coming up, and they all got canceled due to the plague. Uh, yep. We're, my other band, Sound of Animals Fighting, has some stuff in the works. We're planning a live stream right now. It looks like the Bandit shows are going to be pushed till 2022. 
and I have a solo record coming out this year and a couple other things, but uh, I don't have any dates, so I don't want to, I don't want to tell anyone what it is. <laughs> fair, fair enough. Well, uh, if the listeners like to find you online, what's the best place to do so? Uh, you can go to uh, my record label is mdbcollective.com. I has all my music on there, all the different stuff. My little label is just a, a like a boutique vinyl label. We just do small runs of stuff. Um, we're going to have a couple more releases come out this year. Uh, and follow me on Instagram. It's at Matthew Embry. Awesome. Sounds good. Well, Matt, thank you so much. It was uh, it was an absolute pleasure, and I wish you nothing but the best of luck. Hey, man. Seriously, Chris, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate you reaching out for this. It was it was very enjoyable. I, I really dig what you're doing with this show. I really, you know, I can't say enough how much I appreciate your attention to detail with all this. What's up, everybody? I am Finn McKenty, host of the Punk Rock NBA podcast, part of the Sound Talent Media Podcast Network. My podcast is all about doing what you love for a living, and every week I sit down and talk to people who have done exactly that. For example, musicians like Tommy from Between the Buried Me, Matt from Periphery, Lil Lotus and Shinigami, among many others, photographers, artists, designers, YouTubers like Glenn Fricker and Sarah Dietschy, and I unpack exactly how they got to where they are today with the goal of helping you do the same. So if that sounds cool, you can listen and subscribe at SoundTalentMedia.com, and I'll see you there. As we near the end of the show, here's a band you might not know. Welcome to this week's Band You Might Not Know. If you'd like your band to be considered for Krista Makes a Podcast, all you have to do is submit your song and bio to bandyoumightnotknow at gmail.com. This week's featured band is the Ballantines, a 60s-inspired soul garage band from Vancouver, British Columbia. The Ballantines are Jared O'Dell on keys, guitar, and vocals, Vanessa Dandurn on vocals, Jennifer Wilkes on keys and vocals, Corey Pollock on guitar and vocals, Max Sample on bass and vocals, and Michael McDiarmid on drums. You can find their music on Bandcamp. Here's a snippet of their song, Alive. Chris and Chris. Okay, so before we get too deep into that episode, let's get a couple of the little things out of the way. First of all, do you know the difference between a simile and a metaphor now? <laughs> well, in, in all fairness, it, the the where he was going with it threw me off. I think, for, I remember the the textbook definition as a kid. I think the simile has to be referencing something like 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 saying like or as. It's comparing. Yes, like or as with a simile. So. Here's the difference. Hungry like the wolf. Chris. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, that works. Chris, you're like a shining star. That's a simile. If I say to you, Chris, you're a shining star. That's a metaphor. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's like an ad, adding like an as. That's a simile versus a metaphor just saying you are. This so thing. what was Matt <laughs> referring to? A simile or a metaphor? Oh, now I forget. <laughs> 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 He's, I forget what it was in reference to. I think it was a metaphor. I think he was referring to a he metaphor. Totally, yeah. He totally stumped me, though, and that's what I love about our podcast is you leave all my warts and all in for the listeners, Chris. Thank you. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and the other thing is, I know you already texted Matt about this, but it is spelled C-U-M-U-L. O-U-S everywhere, including the back cover of the album. <laughs> yes. I, you know, I, I, I like to pride myself on doing my homework. I, I've been stumped a couple times. I can, I can admit when, uh, when I make an error, but I was sure that I looked everywhere. I, I looked at, at images of the album cover, and sure enough, I, I had texted him <laughs> when we got done with the episode, and he uh, said, eh, you're right. He said, uh, I've been proved wrong. So one for me in the cap there, but... Uh, cumulus is spelled C-U-M-U-L-U-S, and it's like a blanket of clouds or something. So it's referring to the same thing. I don't know why there was an O thrown on there, but who knows? It's probably because it seems like it should be spelled that way. Yeah. But anyway, that stuff aside, 
I thought that was an amazing episode. You know I was excited about this episode. I feel like I've been text messaging you like, dude, you realize how amazing RX Bandits are, right? <laughs> like sending you like live videos and stuff. I absolutely love this band. This Gemini, Her Majesty album is incredible. They have so many. That and the Battle Begun albums, amazing. They're a true band's band. And there were a lot of things in this episode where it's like, yeah, that's a band's band. When he mentioned how they wanted the producer to just help with the sonics and not be involved in the songwriting whatsoever, that's a very band's band type of thing. Not playing to a click, that's a very band's band sort of thing. Yeah. N- not one bit worried about like those things you might think about when you're writing a song. Like, I don't know, if we don't play to a click, might not play this on the radio <laughs> or you know things like that. You would never know they don't play to a click because they're that good of players, first of all. Right, and I, and I do want to say for the listeners, you know, I know we talk about a click and a metronome sometimes, and for those that don't know, basically it's the beat behind the beat. You're hearing it in your headphones. It's tick, 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 tick. It's keeping you in time. And the reason you use a click is because most of us, myself included as a musician, don't keep perfect time. And when you're a band that doesn't have to play with the aid of a click or a metronome, you're really damn good. And the RX Bandits are really damn I'm good and Chris you know I stopped short in the episode of saying this because you know it almost comes off sometimes like you're, you're maybe saying to a band that you know you're you, you guys haven't got your just due or you're you should be more popular and you, you almost make them feel like maybe they aren't uh they haven't done something right but I, I just I think these guys are so underrated and and more people should know about them I mean in our world of music they are probably the number one most underrated band ever they're just from a songwriting perspective, they're incredible. They're they're the closest thing to being. Uh, it's funny because they have an album called Progress. Uh, they're like a progressive punk rock band. <laughs> you know, like that's the best way I can put it. Their their album that go listen to Gemini, Her Majesty, from front to back, and. It, just like you're talking about this song being a journey, that album is a journey. Mm. It's almost like I don't want to tell someone, like, check out this one song. Or, I mean, this is a perfect example of if you're going to check out one song, check out this song because this song in itself is a journey. But that album is that way. But I yeah. They, they have elements of, of a jam band, progressive band. I mean, there's elements of Rush and a band like Dream Theater in their music. There's reggae elements. There's some ska in their earlier stuff. Uh, the, the metal influence of the guitar riffs. I had mentioned Iron Maiden. Uh, these guys are, are all over the place, but at the same time, there's a cohesiveness to it. Unbelievable, man. My memory of hearing this album for the first time was uh, we were recording at our friend's studio in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, called The Kaleidoscope. And I believe it was my friend Ben Roth who put this record on, like on vinyl. It's real nice at the studio. They have like a record player and just tons of actual records, you know, and you're li- listening to them. And I remember we were in the main room and we were hacky sacking. Everyone was hacky sacking together. That's our thing. And this album was on. And I remember being like, what is this? This is absolutely amazing. He's like, oh, it's our expandits. I'm like, wow, this is so good. And uh, I've been just like such an enormous fan ever since. And it's funny because the first time I ever heard them, if Punchline played with RX Bandits, it had to be either 2001 or 2002. It's some weird place like, oh, something Cantina in San Angelo, Texas. <laughs> and they were amazing back then too, but they were very different. They, they weren't what they are now, you know? Yeah, no, they're, they're a band that, uh, hate to use the word again, that just keeps progressing, you know, not just in mm. uh, as a style of music, but just as players. They keep pushing pushing themselves to, to go into different territories. And I find that I find that really, really cool. Not a lot of bands can do that. I also feel very lucky, and this has happened a couple of times now on the show, that uh, I, I got an artist to open up to me like Matt did I know that it was it was difficult uh, and you can tell that it's uh, something that truly bothers him uh, to, to this day and probably always will and the fact that uh, he shared that with us I thought, thought that was really special that was one of my favorite episodes that uh, we've done so far for sure and the fact that he would open up about that I, I think that you know when you're you're an artist you're dying to open up about it in a way, but at the same time, it like hurts a lot to open up about it because I'm not talking shit, <laughs> but I think this is a little bit of a testament to you, man, 
too, and, and what we do with this show is that you're talking about things that I don't know how many interviews we've done or podcasts where it's like, where'd you get the name of your band? What are you going to play in um, Minneapolis next? <laughs> or, you know, just these like generic questions that we've all been asked a million times, but digging into the song a lot of times, I mean, dude, so much respect to Matt for opening up about that. That Just like you said in the episode, this song that I already loved is going to mean that much more to me when I listen to it to know that there is so much feeling and so much emotion behind it. And it's not just like, oh, these words sounded cool. <laughs> you know, Absolutely. It's, it's and awesome. there, was, there was times when I would, I would say a lyric to him and it would just kind of stump him for a second because uh, to your point, I don't think he's ever been asked that before. Uh, you know, in in a show, an interview, a podcast, you know, he's ever been asked to to look at it from from that vantage point. And it was uh, again, I, I I feel really uh, really privileged that he opened up to us and, and was able to share all that. Yeah, it was really awesome, man. I liked before we did the episode when you were talking about those lines after what is it after the second chorus? I, I forget exactly where it lands in there, but there were those lines that weren't in any of the lyrics online. Yeah. So you and I, you and I were just listening to them over and over, being like, "What do you think he says there?" We were trying to decipher it, but as it turns out. It wasn't actually uh, specific lyrics. It was like a, a take. They used a take where he kind of, I don't what do you want to call that, vamped? He vamped Well, he, he had of... referred to it as a scratch vocal. And, uh, you know, again, right. again, for the listeners that don't know, a scratch vocal is just a, basically a guide vocal. It's a practice vocal that you put down so the other musicians know where you're at in the song. It's a placeholder. And in this instance, he kept the original placeholder vocal because he could not match the vibe of it. Uh, hence why we couldn't figure out what the hell he was saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But... I loved it, man. Amazing songwriter. I've been watching those live videos. I think those audio tree videos. And one more thing I want to mention before we finish this rap is uh, Steve Choi, absolutely incredible guitarist, writer. Uh, he also plays the keys in our expandits. He is a fellow uh, Sound Talent Network uh, podcast host. Yes. Yeah, so hello, Steve. Yeah, so we got to get him on here sometime too. But uh, awesome episode, man. Heck yeah, it was. And speaking of awesome, our listeners are awesomely generous each month in their contributions over at ChrisToMakesADifference.com. Yeah, they most definitely are, man. You should tell them about this month's fundraiser. I would love to. Our fundraiser for May is the Cure LGM D2I Foundation. Limb girdle muscular dystrophy type 2I is a progressively debilitating disease, and their foundation provides funding for research programs to establish a treatment for this disease. So yeah, please head over to ChrisToMakesADifference.com and give whatever you can give. And, and thanks to each and every one of you for supporting uh, the fundraisers we do each month. Your generosity goes a long way. Thank you. Yeah, this is a fundraiser that's near and dear to me personally. I have a friend with LGM D2I, and uh, I just think that if you can contribute 5, 10, 20, I mean, even a buck, if you can contribute, it all adds up and it helps uh, go towards research for this rare form of muscular dystrophy. So head over to ChrisDemakesADifference.com if you can. That's right. And hey, we have a VIP program called Supporting Cast that we'd like to uh, invite you to be a part of. Yeah, man. Speaking of Chris Demakes uh, related domain names, <laughs> if you go to ChrisDemakes.com, dude, you could you could just go to ChrisDemakes.com, ChrisDemakesADifference.com, ChrisDemakesABook.com, all these great Chris Demakes domain names. But right now we're talking about ChrisDemakes.com, which takes you to our supporting cast program. It's if you love this podcast and you want to see it keep going and you want to get bonus episodes and you want to get discounts on upcoming merch, which we have coming very soon. And you want some surprises along the way for the price of buying us a cup of coffee or a beer a month. We'd really appreciate it. That's right. You know, and, and your feedback is paramount to us. We we love hearing what you have to say. You've given us such great ideas so far. All the folks who are over in the Chris to Makes a Podcast Facebook group. So any suggestions you have for supporting cast, we'd love to hear them because we want to make this as cool as we can for you. Chris and I are having a, having a ball with this. We're, we're, we're you know, like, it, it's not just uh, about songwriting. We can pretty much talk about whatever we want, Chris, with the, uh, with the, with the VIP program. Yeah, in the after party, we talk about whatever we want. We keep this podcast of songwriting. That is our subject matter. But in the after party, anything goes. So if you have a suggestion, we'd love to hear it. And hey, Chris, before we go, dude, 
We did it. 50 episodes. 50 episodes of Krista Makes a Podcast. The big 5-0. Yeah, we're there, man. It's pretty awesome. And it was pretty awesome to have Matt Embry as our guest on our 50th episode. Absolutely. Thanks to Matt Embry from the RX Bandits for being on the show this week. And we'll see you next week. The number you have reached is 100.7 WMMS. It wasn't just a radio station, it was a lifestyle. Cleveland is, is a rock and roll city for sure. I do like the shot. Get down! The Wrath of the Buzzer. WMMS. Cleveland. The rise and fall of one of the most iconic radio stations in America. Profiles. The Wrath of the Buzzard. P-R-O-H Files. Subscribe now wherever you get podcasts. Hey there, I am Johnny Christ from Avenged Sevenfold, and I've got a podcast called Drinks with Johnny you're going to want to check out. I sit down with a bunch of different people from all different walks of life, from professional wrestlers to actors, comedians, fighters, musicians, everything in between. I'm just looking to make some friends and have a good time doing it. So if that sounds like something you're into, go check out Drinks with Johnny, streaming everywhere now.